Hello, everyone. Welcome into another East Alabama Works video podcast. I'm Carl Brady, the uh, Workforce Program Manager for East Alabama Works. We are Region 2, the Alabama Workforce Council covering East Alabama, the Seven County Region of East Alabama. And my guest today is with Alabama's Small Business Development Center, the Associate Director of the Small Business Development Center, Michael Brooks. Michael, welcome in uh, to our podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Carl. Glad to be here. Well, we've got a lot to uh, to talk about with the uh, COVID nineteen crisis that's uh, underway. The you know the main thing we want to talk about is uh, all of the different things that are available out there for small businesses to get them through this crisis situation. Uh, the, the, a lot of things have been happening. A lot of things change very quickly. So uh, just kind of give us a, a little bit of an update as to where we got to where we are right now. We're on our second round of funding for uh, disaster loans and the Paycheck Protection Program. But if you will, just kind of give us a quick overview uh, of how we got here and, uh, and, and, and what the uh, Small Business Development Center's role is in what's going on right now. Sure, thanks, Carl. Uh, well, how we got here. Um, the the two major programs we can talk about are really the SBA Disaster Loan Program and then the Paycheck Protection Program. So we'll start with the one that was available first, uh, SBA's Disaster Loan Program. Now that's been around for years. It's been a very uh, useful tool that we've used in Alabama uh, after oil spills, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, and on limited occasions with droughts. Some of the folks in the ag industry have used it uh, for droughts that have, been impact, that have impacted the state. Uh, with regards to this crisis, the first step was the governor making a declaration of a disaster. And we worked with the governor's office and A. Postel, uh, Office of Small Business Advocacy, to survey a handful of companies to collect the data that's required so the governor can make that submission to SBA so that a disaster can officially be declared. Once that declaration happened, then companies in Alabama were eligible to apply for these disaster loans. Now, we were about a day and a half behind some of our southeastern neighbors. Uh, so some of the contiguous counties, some of the counties that were touching Florida, uh, Georgia, uh, Tennessee, and, and then eventually Mississippi, uh, those counties at the periphery were able to apply a, about a day before everyone else. But uh, in mid-March, uh, the entire state of Alabama, actually by March 20th, I believe, uh, the entire state of Alabama was eligible for these disaster loans. Uh, there was a few hiccups in the rollout of that program. Uh, keep in mind, these were originally designed for a geographically isolated disaster. So with an oil spill, it's just the folks down uh, uh, along the shoreline and the, the contiguous counties that were impacted, or directly impacted. Um, and with tornadoes, et cetera, it's going to be limited. So. In a normal disaster, SBA is only expecting a few hundred thousand applications at any given time, not all 50 states plus territories uh, running to the exact same portal within a three-day period. And as one might expect, uh, especially since that portal was designed on some slightly dated software, it, it did not last. And it ended up crashing uh, just a few days into the disaster declaration. They had an interim period where you could upload some documents. Um, that was basically a Band-Aid to put out there while they were working on a replacement. Then finally, uh, March uh, 29th, the evening of the 29th, uh, they did launch a new portal for the disaster loan. And that remained open through the evening of March 29th through April 15th, uh, when appropriations had elapsed, and they weren't sure if they would have uh, funds available to fulfill all of the applications they accepted. They cut off new applications. So basically, they, they ran out of money much more quickly than they expected. Yes, uh, incredibly high demand uh, for the pay, for, excuse me for the disaster loan program, mm -hmm. uh, and out of an abundance of caution, they they did cut that off early. Additional funding has been provided, additional uh, fifty billion dollars, I believe, for the disaster loan, and ten billion dollars for that forgivable advance, that up to ten thousand dollar forgivable advance that was deployed as part of the disaster loan program. And uh, once uh, once a, a new declaration was made, or or Congress got together and they they passed uh, the CARES Act that uh, included 
uh, something that we weren't familiar with, and that was the PPP program, which is the Paytech Paycheck Protection Program, and this was providing it's a, an additional source of, uh, of funding for small businesses. Tell us how that uh, came about and how that works. Sure. Now, the the uh, the CARES Act had there are several different parts to it. One major part of interest to small business owners is Paycheck Protection Program, uh, PPP. Now, I'm I'm a little hesitant to call it a small business program. Uh, the reality is it's paycheck protection. Now it's delivered through small businesses and intended for small businesses to help keep their employees on payroll. But the real uh, intended target for this are the actual employees, not necessarily small businesses, because within a PPP, there's only a certain amount of funding that you're able to use and be forgiven uh, that you can use for non-payroll purposes. So really the, the intent behind Congress's uh, legislation there was getting money into the hands of employees because they recognized that with business being shut down, with the, the isolation and social distancing in effect, they needed to do something to make sure there was still, still some fuel in the economic pump. Uh, you don't want an economy the size of the United States cratering out and hitting zero. Uh, this was Congress's one way they thought of how do we quickly inject cash back into the economy to keep things flowing so that when we can pull up from this economic nosedive, that there's still some fuel so we can keep uh, make for an easier recovery once things start to open back up. So uh, with you saying it that way, is it uh, uh, inappropriate for the folks who are angry at big companies that took advantage of this and got some of that money and got millions and millions of dollars while some of our small businesses weren't able to... Uh, to, to, to get in and get any of that money at all in the initial round? Uh, I, I think it's fair. I think it's very fair and appropriate for people to be upset. Uh, there's incredibly high demand. It was challenging getting the program rolled out in the first place. Uh, there's confusion among uh, the application process and the calculation, and there's still some confusion or at least some gray areas that have yet to be resolved on the forgiveness side uh, eight weeks after you receive that funding. So, uh, you know, upset at these larger businesses. On one hand, you know, in many of the news reports, I, I hear it being called a loophole. Uh, but the way I look at it is someone in Congress wrote that into the legislation. It's, it was not a, oops, we didn't think of that angle and these companies took advantage of it. It is very clearly spelled out in the legislation. Someone intentionally wrote in there uh, for industries in Sector 72, NAICS code, hotel, restaurant, et cetera, there is a carve out if you have over 500 employees that you can participate. Again, the flip side of that coin is Congress intends to get money back to the frontline workers. And there's not a whole lot where, let's say, uh, uh, what is Shake Shack and Ruth's Chris, uh, there's not a lot of funding available that corporate headquarters would be able to retain or use. Uh, it was intended to all go into payroll, into those frontline workers and, and the kitchen staff, et cetera. That said, these are also very large companies that have cash reserves or probably have access to additional lines of credit or other sources of cash where if they wanted to provide that to their employees, they could. And you look at the amount of dollars that is used by one of these large companies, these large restaurants, restaurant chains, how many independent small businesses, how many independent restaurants could have taken advantage of those funds that were encumbered by these uh, larger businesses? Uh, so I, I do. I think it's, it's fair to be upset. Uh, and then at some point, when the time is right, we, we can ask our elected officials exactly how that got in there. Exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the disaster loan program and the PPP program. Um, one of the, the unique things about uh, the, the programs that have been uh, passed as part of the COVID-19 response is that some of the money is uh, forgivable and it turns into a grant at some point as opposed to a loan. Can you talk about that? Because that's kind of uh, new to the, the whole process of uh, SBA programs. Yeah, the, uh, so there's, there's two parts that are forgivable that turn into a grant. On the original disaster loan program, uh, they added something in that version three when they fixed the application process. Uh, they streamlined it so that if you wanted, you could request an up to $10,000 forgivable advance. 
And, and that's relatively, that is very new, not relatively new, that's brand new in, in the world of SBA, a forgivable advance. Uh, it, the initial marketing made it sound like everybody gets a $10,000 advance. It was a very uh, Oprah Winfrey, Ed McMahon type of moment. The reality set in when they figured out funding that they needed to find a better way to deploy that. And they eventually released, they, they did have some behind the scenes math where it was calculated on the number of employees. So it's $1,000 per employee, up to 10 employees. Uh, so you could get that $10,000 advance. Uh, and that could be used for working capital expenses. That could be used for payroll. Uh, the original idea is that people would get their disaster loan before the Paycheck Protection Program kicked in. The reality is it's a mixed bag. Some folks are getting them in reverse order, um, but they're eligible uh, and taking advantage of both. But the other forgivable part and the big part where we get a lot of questions is on the Paycheck Protection Program. And this is where uh, the CARES Act allows for a certain amount of funds to be deployed to small businesses for them specifically and intentionally to use on payroll. Uh, it's calculated on 2.5 times your average monthly payroll from the prior year. And uh, they put a stipulation in that once you receive the funds, you have eight weeks to spend it. And during that eight week period, they want you to spend 75% of the proceeds on payroll. And then 25% you could use on other allowable expenses, uh, may usually, Folks have uh, interest on a mortgage uh, and certain utilities are included. At the end of that eight week period, you're able to gather your documentation and basically show a paper trail how you use the funds. Uh, start from zero and you build up and you're able to show the lender that provided the funds to you. You're able to show them how you deployed them and that you use them for allowable expenses. And then the lender, upon reviewing that, has 60 days uh, basically to confirm that yes, you've spent this within parameters of the program and it's a forgivable loan. It, it's written off. You mentioned the lenders. Uh, talk a little bit about the process uh, for disaster loans and for PPP. Um, you know, the, there's the SBA process and, uh, and, and, I, and I'm not clear on it myself. Uh, are you applying directly to the S SBA uh, or do you, ha you have to go through uh, a lender who handles this these types of products. So kind of clarify that for us a little bit. No, a great, great question. And, and there is often confusion around that. Uh, on the disaster loan product and that up to $10,000 advance, that's purely through SBA. This is one of the few times where SBA provides loans direct to the small business owner. Uh, you apply directly on the SBA website. Right now, they're not accepting applications. Uh, at some point, they may return and, and accept additional ones, but that product is delivered through and you apply through uh, sba.gov. The paycheck program, uh, the intent there was to engage, engage banks, existing lenders, um, initially that already had a relationship with SBA. The thought there was that uh, Congress understood that it was difficult enough for SBA to deploy disaster loan funds and then when you put $349 billion, the initial pot for the paycheck program, it was going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for SBA to deploy those funds. So you lean on your existing commercial infrastructure, your lenders that were already accustomed to working with SBA and SBA products. So small businesses that want to use Paycheck Protection Program, we recommend they start with their existing lender. Find out, are they participating in the paycheck program are they still accepting applications? Some of them are not. Uh, and it's going to be the lender that uh, accepts your application, reviews it. They, once they've reviewed it and signed off on it, they upload it to SBA. And that's how SBA knows that a certain amount of money has been encumbered for uh, a paycheck protection loan. And so that way they know how quickly are we using these funds? How much do we have left? One of the challenges we ran into, uh, a lot of our small businesses um, couldn't get access in the first round because they didn't have a relationship with a lender that was participating in the program. Or uh, what happened is that the, the lenders uh, were going to serve their customers first. From a banker's point of view, this is a uh, high effort, low yield product. Uh, you know, they're responsible to their shareholders and to their customers. So the thing that they want to do is make sure they serve their customers first and then at the end of the day, if uh, they had time available and money available, they'd consider bringing on new customers. So a lot of small businesses in Alabama 
they weren't banking with uh, Wells or uh, Bank of America or Regions or some of the, the larger banks. And they may have been working with a local credit union uh, or some of the, the smaller lenders in the area that weren't engaged in SBA programs. So they may have missed out on that first round of funding. In the second round of funding, uh, Congress did something very intentional. Uh, they carved out an additional $60 billion and reserved that just for uh, small to medium-sized banks. And I forget the exact uh, limit there, but there's a certain billion dollars in assets uh, cap on these banks. Uh, $30 billion for that small to medium size and $30 billion for that small and smaller size, if you will. Uh, the intent there was to do a better job at making sure that these funds get out to underserved markets, rural markets, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, uh, statistically folks that generally are less likely to have banking relationships with some of these larger banks. And without modifying the actual application that people used, they simply changed things on the back end uh, so that when these bankers, when the lenders upload information to the SBA database, uh, they know whether it's coming from a big bank or a small bank, uh, and that's how they're managing it on, on their end. So the second round of funding was passed last week and earlier this week. The uh, application process for the paycheck program was uh, reopened. Uh, what are you hearing from, uh, from, from people who are applying on this round? Uh, is it going smoothly? Are people getting through? What, 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 are, what are you hearing from that? Um, we're hearing a little bit of everything. Uh, we're, we're hearing, uh, number one, we're hearing success. Uh, companies that applied in the first round and companies that have started applying this week uh, are getting through and the applications are getting filled uh, and they're getting funded. So there's a lot of excitement out there that, and, and some relief, frankly, that after a lot of anxiety and anticipation and false starts, uh, it is coming through. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of frustration because for just as many people that are getting their loans filled, uh, there's one, maybe two people that are still in limbo. Uh, their bank has an application, but it has been uploaded. Uh, their bank isn't accepting applications right now. There's a question mark around it. Uh, there were challenges with their application. And so there's, we've got a mixed bag. We've got some satisfaction, but we still have a lot of uh, anxiety and worry. Uh, the optimistic news, the good news is that it, it's working and they are getting out there uh, despite the slow start. That's good that it's working and, uh, and, and money is starting to flow. People are starting to see money come into their, uh, into their bank accounts. What do you see for the immediate future? We hear Congress is working on additional um, funding for different types of programs and, and, and things. Uh, what, what are you seeing on the horizon as part of the uh, COVID-19 response? Uh, good, good question. I think uh, there is going to be unmet demand uh, for additional funding. Uh, I think that uh, there's an opportunity to provide additional funding either through the paycheck program or really back through the original disaster loan program. I think companies will find that while the paycheck program had the bigger dollar sign and made a bigger news splash, if you're a small business owner, the flexibility of the SBA disaster loan is realistically a, a much better product. Uh, it, it does cost a little bit more in terms of a percentage rate and the way that the financing works, but it's still, it's a disaster loan. It's very low cost relative to anything else that's out there. Uh, hopefully there will be an opportunity to provide additional funding for that and we'll see that pick back up. I think that's a longer term solution for a lot of small business owners where the paycheck program is a, an eight week bandaid that helps with payroll and helps with marginal expenses on the side. Uh, it's not a true small business saving type of legislation. Uh, it definitely helps the economy, but small business owners, uh, I think, are going to need to look, take a closer look back at the disaster loan. In terms of other legislation that uh, Congress is looking at, I'm not sure I have a great crystal ball as to what's coming next. Uh, I know that there's discussion about uh, another round of funding uh, and then throwing some additional clauses in there to help companies uh, as they reopen, as the economy picks back up, uh, mitigate some of the challenges in dealing with uh, a COVID-19 situation, uh, whether it's with customers or product or service delivery, uh, how that's going to work, what that's going to look like in the future. 
What is your best advice for small business owners right now in the current situation that are still struggling, still looking for ways to keep their business open? What, what are you telling folks uh, who are calling you for advice? I think the main thing at this point, uh, because the frustration and anxiety is, is really an all time high is to not get discouraged. Uh, we recognize that uh, the, the rollout of these uh, disaster loan programs was not smooth. It was suboptimal as we say. Um, that said, they've started to work and we're starting to see the results. Uh, I know that patience is in short supply at this point and people are looking for answers. Uh, the cash reserves that many small businesses have or really right now at the point where those have been depleted or they're looking at next week at the very best before those are gone. And if the loan programs don't kick in, then the true, true panic and, and uh, financial stress really sets in. Uh, we're telling folks that uh, there are options out there, that there is help available. Uh, and we're hoping that the Congress can provide some additional assistance to keep things going. We're also hopeful that uh, on a state by state and sometimes uh, city, city by city basis, we'll start to see the economy pick back up. Uh, I don't think we're going to see an instant jump start, uh, but I do think we're going to see things start to move in the right direction. Well, Michael, before we go, let's talk a little bit about the work that you guys do when we're not in a crisis uh, situation. The Small Business Development Center has offices throughout the state of Alabama, usually based at a local university here in, uh, here in East Alabama. You have an office at Jacksonville State University. And talk a little bit about the, the, the advice and the, the work that you guys do with small businesses throughout the state when you're not in, in crisis mode like right now. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we we do cover the entire state. Uh, we are uh, partnered with many of the four-year institutions in the state. Uh, you are definitely lucky to have Jacksonville State in your backyard. Uh, there have been a, a long-time all-star within the SBC program, but really all of our offices at this point are, are doing incredible work in the disaster recovery, disaster response area. You know what we normally do, what we we signed up for. Uh, part of it's disaster response, but the core of what we do is really it, it, we're growing Alabama's economy one small business at a time. It's more than just a tagline for us. Uh, it's really what we put our passion, our hearts, and our talents into because we've got a staff of about 40 folks, uh, serial entre entrepreneurs, uh, former recovering bankers, a few CPAs, a few attorneys, uh, all folks that have incredible experience with small business uh, working one-on-one -on -one in a confidential and unbiased way with small businesses. So we're not trying to sell folks something at, at the end of the webinar. Uh, and we try to be as blunt and realistic as possible in giving uh, the best and most timely advice. Well, we've got a really strong track record. We've been in the state helping companies for uh, a little over 40 years now. Uh, just last year, we helped uh, start over 200 something companies uh, and over 2000 new jobs in the state. And we're looking forward to getting back to that, helping companies start, scale, and grow. We've got a few specialty programs, a Procurement Technical Assistance Center, PTAC. It's a separate program. They do an outstanding job with government contracting. Uh, a lot of that activity, obviously, in, in Huntsville, Pentagon South, if you will, uh, but really throughout the state. And over the last five years, our, our PTAC team has helped companies in Alabama win $1.6 billion in federal contracts. Uh, that's incredible cash injection coming back to the state of Alabama, federal dollars at work helping small businesses in the state. Uh, and then we've got a, a capital access team, our CAP team. Uh, they're, they've really been the ones spearheading uh, these nonstop uh, marathon webinars from mid-March up until uh, 11 a.m. this morning, um, helping companies understand what these programs are, but uh, really helping them grow their business through financing and looking at the different ways to do capital stacking, uh, structuring some of the challenging uh, debt and equity deals to help them uh, start and grow. Uh, last year, looking at uh, almost $100 million in financing for small businesses and about $350 million over the last five years. Uh, we're looking forward to getting back to that, helping companies with that. Uh, but we're really excited to be able to play an important role in helping them during the disaster. Uh, instead of helping folks uh, grow and thrive, we're helping them survive uh, so that hopefully in months from now, we can get back to what we normally do, uh, growing the small businesses we get to work with. 
Awesome. Now, Michael, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you can find out more information uh, by going to their website, asbdc.org. There you can find uh, general contact information for the Small Business Development Center. You can also find the local branch office and information uh, with contact, uh, contact names, contact phone numbers, that kind of information for uh, all of the local uh, offices around the state, including Jacksonville State's uh, office here in East Alabama. Michael, quickly, anything uh, anything we left out, anything you'd like to add before we go? Uh, no, Carl, I appreciate the opportunity of being uh, able to talk with you today and helping us get the word out about these programs. Uh, if there are companies that are watching this, or if you work with companies, if there's chambers, any, any way that you can help spread the word, uh, the SBC, uh, PTAC, our international trade program. Uh, these companies are out there to help. There's no charge. It's confidential. Uh, and we definitely encourage folks to reach out because we're, we want to help every single company in the state make sure we get through this one piece. All right. Very good. Thank you very much, Michael, for joining us today. And uh, folks, thank you for watching our video podcast uh, for this week with East Alabama Works. You can go to our website, eastalabamaworks.com, for more information about all the things that we do in East Alabama with East Alabama Works. Thanks for joining us.